You're listening to the Greek's Gridiron. Now here's your host, Ethan Haristadulu. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to the Greek's Gridiron. I am Ethan Haristadulu, and today it is time to make some predictions going into week number three of the NFL. Currently sitting on a record of 17 and 15. We split at 8 and 8 last week. It's been a wild couple of weeks in the NFL where it feels like the power structure of the league that we've known the last few years is going through some changes. And a lot of people seem to be reflecting that in power rankings and discussion as to who's the best, who's the not. I obviously reflected that in my power rankings. If you haven't checked them out, make sure you do at the end of this video. But we're diving in. We're making game picks. Remember, this is not a betting channel. We are talking football and just talking winners and losers. Comment down below. Let me hear your thoughts, your picks, thoughts on my picks. Starting off, though, with the first game of the weekend, we have ourselves. The New England Patriots heading into New York to take on the Jets. New England coming in allowing the fifth lowest points per game this season right now at just 16.5 points to both Cincinnati and Seattle in their first couple of matchups here. New York themselves... While by no means perfect offensively, they have come in managing a solid 21.5 points per game right now, which puts them right in about the middle of the league. I really think that one thing to look at here is going to be that New York Jets pass rush and how they're going to test the Patriots' O-line. They rank first in overall pressure rate in the NFL right now when New England's offensive line is ranked second worst at allowing total pressure. And on top of that, when you look at the other side of things, the one thing that they are good at is New England's rushing attack. They might not be able to block pass passes, but they are able to get leverage and open up running lanes as they currently rank fourth best in the league right now with 177 yards per game rushing with the New York Jets allowing about 155 themselves which is good for ninth most in the league there could be some trouble as far as handling the rushing attack but I don't really expect Jacoby Brissett and company who literally had five targets to their wide receivers last week and not one even going to Demario Douglas to have much of a passing attack against this Jets defense here I'll be very curious to see if they opt to maybe throw the football a little bit more against this Jets defense considering again Again, just how good they are against the pass, but I'm not going to hold my breath. I really think this is going to be a ground and pound football game on New England's end. And I'll be curious to see just how New York decides to attack this Patriots defense here because it's not like they've done anything extremely well on either side. I think they're about average as far as both running and passing the football goes. So a little bit of a mystery as to how I would expect to see this Jets uh, offense attack the defense here because the Patriots are a pretty good unit altogether. So I'll be interested in seeing what they do there. As for any important key injuries to keep in mind, remember Jermaine Johnson is now out for the season with a torn Achilles, C.J. Mosley, the linebacker is listed as questionable right now and then the Patriots it seems like Gerard Mayo learned a lesson or two while he was under Bill Belichick as far as reporting injuries because they have just a laundry list of guys 10 players listed as questionable on their injury report right now so it feels like that gamesmanship is still very much a thing in New England so hard to really tell what injuries could and could not factor in but we do know Jermaine Johnson will not be playing. As for the final score, though, who I think is going to win the matchup here, I really feel like I'm going to have to lean with the New York Jets on this one here. I just think that defensively, they might have a hair or two better uh, in terms of just, or they might just be a hair or two better defensively in terms of talent and just overall what they're doing over there on the defensive side of the football. And I trust Aaron Rodgers to get it done against this Patriots team, especially at home here. A lot of emotion coming into this one here, obviously with Aaron Rodgers tearing his Achilles last year in the home open for New York so I think that this is going to be one of those right the wrongs of last year even though he did get the win last year he's going to come in and actually get his win start and finish the football game and lead them to a two and one start on the season so give me the New York Jets Moving into game number two, start looking at the Sunday matchups here. First one that we have on the dock, it's going to be the New York Giants heading into Cleveland to take on the Browns. For me on this one, the first thing that came to mind when I sat down to look at this football game is who handles the pressure best. Cleveland currently ranks number eight, while the New York Giants rank number nine in overall pressure rate this season here, and both teams' offensive lines have struggled with allowing pressure. Cleveland more so than the New York Giants, oddly enough, but the Giants have shown that their offensive struggles as far as pass protection go from last year are kind of creeping into this year as well and the floodgates could open even further going up against this Cleveland pass rush here. 
Both teams have struggled to get points on the board right now as New York is currently averaging a measly 12 points per game, which is good for 31st in the league. Cleveland themselves not doing too much better, but at least a little bit with that 17 and a half points that they're averaging, which puts them at about 22nd. But both these teams ranking in the bottom third of the league right now as far as getting points on the board is concerned. Both quarterbacks ranking in the bottom five in the NFL right now as well in terms of yards per attempt, both sitting with completion percentages under 60%, which leads me to the conclusion that as for who wins this game and why they win this game, it's probably going to come down to defense. I think this is going to be a very defensive, heavy football game. Uh, the defense was supposed to be somewhat of a bright spot for the Giants coming into this season here. And, and unfortunately, I feel like the offense has been so bad, it's kind of put the defense into some bad spots here. So maybe we see the defense right a little bit of those wrongs this week, being that the Browns offense has not necessarily been the greatest themselves. And then on the flip side of things, the Browns defense, while maybe not off to the red hot start, they were last season has still been a pretty good group one thing to keep an eye on is going to be penalties in this one here when I was going through some of the numbers here both these teams are currently tied for fifth in total defensive penalties right now committed so I think whoever plays by the book plays within the rules keeps it clean but effective on defense probably comes out victorious in this matchup here I think this one might be one of those uglier contests we get this weekend lower scoring affair potentially maybe we see like a defensive touchdown from one of the two sides something along those lines as for who comes out victorious here one thing I did consider coming into this matchup here is of course Jedrick Wills and Jack Conklin the offensive tackles for the Browns could potentially miss this matchup here along with tight end David and Joku but the issues that I have seen from this Giants offense through two weeks now have just really not made me feel very confident in being able to go with them in a matchup at least at this point in the season right now against a team like the Cleveland Browns who again have that good defense so I am leaning the New York Giant or excuse me the Cleveland Browns on this one here Cleveland Browns in this matchup and I have them winning 24 to 16 I wouldn't be shocked to see a defensive touchdown in this one from the Cleveland Browns which is what pushes the score over the 40 point mark for myself but I do think I like Cleveland in this one getting the W. Next, we'll take a look at the Green Bay Packers heading into Tennessee to take on the Titans here. And a big question that everyone's wondering after watching what Green Bay did last week, do they just simply run it back and pound the football on the ground again? Currently right now, as it stands, Tennessee's ranked 10th, 10th against the run through these first couple of weeks right now. However, they do rank 24th against runs outside specifically per NFL Pro. If you guys haven't checked that out, it's pretty sick with the, uh, the amount of just information you can get on teams in there. It is like a, a stats nerd type of heaven, but there is some really good numbers that I think translate to what goes on in the game really well for the, some of you that are maybe rolling your eyes at the amount of stats that we get in the NFL these days and just in sports in general. However, ranking 24th against the run is important to the outside because Green Bay's offense is third in the league when running the football ball outside the tackles here so their bread and butter is taking that football out to the outside heading towards the sideline in those rushing attacks so that is definitely something worth keeping an eye on here is how does Tennessee defend all these outside runs that they wind up using over there in Green Bay if that's the place that they decide to go they definitely should consider stacking the box getting real heavy here make sure that when they stack the box they stack it about as wide as possible here just to really try to maintain those edges of the offense in Green Bay. On top of that, the big thing for Tennessee, they've got to get something going through the year here. They currently right now are sixth fewest in the NFL in terms of passing yards per game right now, sitting at 137 yards per game. Luckily for them, Green Bay has still been a little bit leaky against the pass. It was an issue for them last year, and it still looks like it might be an issue this year as well and is maybe getting better, but at this moment could pose a problem for the time being, allowing 232 yards per game, which is seventh most in the NFL. Tennessee has got to get some semblance of a passing game going if they want to be able to save this first season here. Tennessee also, I think as far as defense is concerned, needs to try their best not just to take away the run because it's what Green Bay's been doing, but also because I think we need to see them really try and force Malik Willis to win this football game with his arm. Tennessee ranks first in passing yards allowed right now with just 114 yards per game. You could say that that number benefits from the fact that they played Chicago in week number one, and I think Caleb Williams came out with like 90 passing yards or something like that in that game there, so maybe that number is skewed a little bit more south than it should be, but they can only play who's on their schedule, and they've done a really good job defending the pass 
to this point here. Harold Landry the third needs to win his battles because he's been really good so far this season. Three sacks, seven pressures altogether, but right tackle Zach Tom, the guy he's probably going to be lining up against for the most part, has allowed pressure on only 3.6% of dropbacks this season. So definitely one of those battles to keep an eye on there, but force Malik Willis to have to beat you with the arm, which means you probably have to get out early to a lead. You got to be effective on offense here, and Tennessee has just got to protect the football plain and simple. They are currently tied for first in the league right now with Denver in offensive turnovers with five. Couple that with the fact that Green Bay's defense has been extremely aggressive going after the football, leading the league in takeaways with six right now. They've got to protect the football. They've got to try to get a lead early and force Malik Willis to win this football game using his arm and not his legs and allowing Green Bay to just ground and pound their way to victory. Stack that box. Do not do what Indianapolis did. As for who I think is going to come out victorious, I am leaning Green Bay in this one in large part because I am just blown away at what we have seen from the Titans offensively. I think the defense is going to keep this game close, and it's not a runaway by any means, but with just how effective Green Bay is on the ground right now, and again, I know Indianapolis just kind of sat back and let them do what they want in like one of the worst ways possible, knowing that Green Bay was going to come in and run and letting them run 53 times for, 200 and, for basically two and a half football fields. I expect that Green Bay, though, is still going to commit to that run game, and it's one of those things where with Tennessee's offense kind of in a bit of a flux right now with throwing the football, I could see maybe a mistake or two that ultimately cost them this football game, and so I'm leading Green Bay. I like them 19-17, to low scoring affair. It's not going to be pretty by any means with a backup quarterback in Green Bay and an offense that's turning it over a lot in Tennessee. Low scoring affair, but I'll take Green Bay for the W. Chicago. Heading into Indianapolis for the next matchup that we're discussing here. The Bears looking to get themselves a second victory here. Going up against the Colts right now that are dealing with a lot of injuries defensively at this current moment here. Gus Bradley's defense has got to get more creative. And I think we definitely learned that last week with how things went against the Green Bay Packers. As I was just mentioning here, you look at the injury report that the Colts are currently working with. The defensive side of things is kind of a mess right now. DeForest Buckner just got put on the IR. Juju Brents got put on the IR last week. Samson Ebukam didn't even make it through preseason with the injury that he sustained. So those are three key guys on your defense that are down and out. Samson Ebukam's not coming back. Juju Brents, I don't think will be coming back either. Hopefully DeForest Buckner is back sooner rather than later. It doesn't sound like his issue is a uh, season-ending injury, but definitely not great. Then you also have a guy like Leato Latu, who's dealing with an injury as well. You have so much devastation on that defensive line right now that I am genuinely concerned as to what this defense is going to look like in Indianapolis. And I was already concerned about them coming into the season, and their greatest strength is being depleted by injuries right now. And I think there is a chance that maybe Chicago does take advantage of that. The good news for Indianapolis, at the very least, is that Chicago comes in, they're ranked 32nd in passing, 28th in rushing. They only have one offensive touchdown, so it's not like there's some offensive machine that they're going up against here. There is some hope for Indianapolis, but these injuries are mounting and things are getting ugly for the Colts right now, even offensively as well. And I could, I could see Chicago's defense being a bit of a nightmare, kind of a matchup for them. Indianapolis has turned the ball over four times, three interceptions last week from Anthony Richardson alone. Not ideal. Going up against Chicago, who has a pretty tight secondary right now with a bunch of guys that are not afraid to go after the football, I am a little bit nervous for what Indianapolis could wind up doing in this game here. You couple that with Chicago boasting the fifth highest pressure rate in the NFL, and the Colts currently ranked 26th overall in just passing efficiency in general. General, this is a kind of nightmare situation right now. And on top of that, Anthony Richardson is not even completing 50% of his throws. Like there is just a lot for me to be concerned about. Bears basically need to do one thing. Give Caleb Williams some time in the pocket. They have not been able to really do that right now. He's tied for most sacks, or the O-line is tied for most sacks allowed, third highest pressure rate in the league. If they can just give Caleb Williams some time, I think Indianapolis has the chance of really shooting themselves in the foot at some point as we've seen to this point in the season and ultimately costing them the game against the Bears defense that has honestly been really good and kept them 
in every single ball game that they've played so far. It's just a matter of the offense needing to play catch up. I really think if the Colts want to come out victorious in this matchup here, taking it to the Bears on the ground is probably going to be the best bet for them. For whatever reason, Colts are averaging 6.1 yards per attempt rushing right now, but they are not running the football like a team or as often as a team would probably typically be running if they were averaging 6.1 yards per carry near the bottom of the league in rushing attempts give the ball to Jonathan Taylor you're paying him all kinds of money to be that star back your young quarterback is struggling give Jonathan Taylor the football that is probably the best route to success for Indianapolis just try to limit the turnovers as much as possible and maybe they have a shot but as for who I think is going to win I'm really leaning Chicago on this one here. Another defensive low-scoring affair. I think some of these 1 o'clock games are going to be ugly because of just the way things are setting up with the defenses versus the offenses and the situation some of the offenses are in. Bears-Colts, not an exception to that. I think this one's low-scoring as well. I have the Bears 19-16. to Now, we'll take a look at, and this is an interesting matchup here. We have ourselves the Houston Texans heading into Minnesota to take on the Vikings. And for those of you that are unaware, these teams have faced off five times before. And the Minnesota Vikings are a perfect 5-0 and against the Texans. They have never lost to Houston. That being said, this is a very different time as opposed to those previous five meetings here. The Houston Texans in quite a good situation, I would say, and arguably their best situation all time as far as franchise success is going to go. I don't know if I've seen a Texans team be as this good and this threatening. Even during like the Matt Schaub, Arian Foster, Andre Johnson days, like those were exciting times, but I don't think I ever really bought those teams as legit Super Bowl contenders the way I am feeling right now about C.J. Stroud and this Houston Texans team being led by D'Amico Ryans. Both of these offenses have been very successful passing the football, Minnesota ranking 7th and Houston ranking 7th. I don't think that's right. I think that's a miss. Uh, that's actually a mistype on my notes. I'm pretty sure there's, like a, there's a discrepancy between there. I think there's like a, a position or two between the two, but I think I wrote that down wrong in my notes. <laughs> that being said... They're both very good at passing the football. I just forget which rank is incorrect and is which is correct and incorrect there. Silly mistake on my part. On top of that, Houston's going to come in and they're currently right now as far as defensive fronts are concerned, one of the more effective in the NFL. Houston currently ranking 3rd in pressure rate. Sam Darnold in Minnesota, when they're facing pressure, not as good as you would like them like them to be. They currently rank 29 when dealing with pressure right now, but Minnesota's offensive line has done a really good job of mitigating that pressure. So the question then just becomes, can Houston be aggressive enough up front to come in and make Sam Darnold uncomfortable? Because I do think we have seen what Sam Darnold looks like when he's under pressure, when he's seeing ghosts and not having a good time behind his offensive line. So if Houston can come in and be a difference maker up front and get after Sam Darnold, I think that fares very well for them. Now on the flip side of things, Brian Flores and what he likes to do defensively loves blitzing the football and currently right now the Vikings rank fourth in the league in terms of blitz rate 34.7 percent of the time they are blitzing their opposing cornerback quarterback and they have rattled their opposing quarterbacks doing just that you saw last week what they did to Brock Purdy six sacks going after him leading the league right now with 11 on top of that and I'll be honest, I was doubting what they were going to be able to do as far as a pass rush this year, losing Daniil Hunter. And I mean, Jonathan Grenard's over there now, really exciting for him, but I was not expecting the pass rush to rebound as quickly as they have and be as good as they have. But Brian Flores has really been dialing it up over there. So they need to get after CJ Stroud, see what they can do. But they need to make sure they can still cover and keep C.J. Stroud in check. Despite all the success they've had getting after quarterbacks, they're still allowing about 230 yards passing per game, which is good for 25th in the league right now. Not great by any means. And C.J. Stroud, for what it's worth, has been money when dealing with the Blitz so far this season, completing 79% of his passes for 151 yards and a touchdown when facing the Blitz. So you have pretty good aerial attacks. And I think the difference maker isn't going to be what these two quarterbacks do. It's going to be who wins on the ground. Yes, they're both going to probably throw the football. Both sides be pretty effective at doing it from what we've seen so far. But 
when you look at what these two teams have done on the ground, both have been fairly successful so far. Houston having a 200-yard game against Indianapolis in Week 1, but only 75 last week against Chicago and a pretty formidable run defense over there. Meanwhile, Minnesota, back-to-back 100-plus-yard rushing games themselves. I think both these run defenses being as strong as they are, ranking in the top 10, whoever can break away and find some success on the ground, maybe gets themselves 100-plus yards rushing, winds up being the team that gets the victory in this here. Some notable injuries to keep in mind as both sides are dealing with a lot of guys on the injury reports at this moment here. And just some more food for thought for you. When you look at the Vikings questionables, Dallas Turner, Andrew Van Ginkel, both their outside linebackers, Aaron Jones, Jordan Addison, all listed as questionable right now. Jordan Addison's been dealing with an injury for a while now and has been playing, has not been playing kind of situation. Then on the Texans side of things, you have Nico Collins, Joe Mixon, Dalton Schultz, uh, linebacker Aziz Al Shair. You have center Juice Scruggs on there as well. And there's even other guys I didn't mention there. But just keep in mind, there are a fair amount of injuries on both sides of the ball. So keep an eye on that injury report because that could affect the way this game swings as well. Final score, though, who I think is going to come out victorious. Again, I mentioned the Vikings 5 0 against Houston all time. The Texans have yet to get that W over the Minnesota Vikings. I'm going Houston to snap that streak. I have them winning 24 to 23, very tight contest. This one is going to be a fun matchup to watch, but I do think that this Texans team has what it takes to finally get the monkey off the back on this one here and get that W and finally break that 5 and 0 streak. We next look at what is going to be one of the more exciting matchups, in my opinion, as the Philadelphia Eagles head into New Orleans to take on the Saints. Defensive struggles against the run are resurfacing for Philadelphia as they're now allowing 157 yards per game, which is good for eighth most in the NFL right now. And New Orleans comes in and they're basically running wild on the ground, averaging 185 yards rushing per game. Alvin Kamara just last week had 115 yards and three touchdowns on the night. This could potentially be a problem for Philadelphia. You couple that with the fact that they're still leaky against the pass as well. And it's it, this looks like it might wind up being a high scoring game if all goes well in Philly's favor. New Orleans currently leading with a massive 45.5 points per game right now scoring, which is an absolute insane number to be working with right now. Then you also have Philadelphia, who has allowed five touchdowns this season. They're allowing 25.5 points per game, which is currently six most in the league. This one could get out of hand if the Eagles offense can't keep up with what's going on over there on New Orleans' end. You couple that with the fact that Philadelphia is sitting on four offensive turnovers this season, New Orleans has five defensive takeaways this season, and you have more things to be concerned about if you're a Philly fan. Now, I do think going into this matchup here, something that Philadelphia really needs to look at is just taking care of the football and not giving it away. Focus on controlling the ball. Don't put it into places where the New Orleans Saints can take it away. But also on top of that, you need to try to find some sort of way to run against this Saints defense here. Saints have been good against the run so far. They're only allowing 63 yards per game, which is good for third lowest in the league here. If they can just find some success, control the football, take a drive or two away from what the Saints have been getting in some of their previous matchups where they just keep getting the ball back and marching down and scoring, limit the amount of opportunities that New Orleans has to score, and I think you'll be all right. The good news is New Orleans, for all the success that they have had, they are ranked 20th against the pass right now. They're 20th in pressure rate, but they are tied for third in sacks. So they're not creating a ton of pressure. They're not necessarily stopping the pass at some un- like unbelievable clip, but there are ways to move the football against them through the air. Philadelphia has been pretty good at throwing the football to this point. They're ranked in the top 10. So I think this is a pretty even matchup. The Eagles just found themselves in a, like, they should be 2-0. They, they basically, you know, decision made their way out of a victory last week. And I remember sitting there watching the game with some friends. And as soon as Philadelphia, you know, didn't convert for that first down or whatever it was that was trying to be done with that pass to Saquon Barkley, I literally said, well, they just lost the football game. They were way too easy on that final drive to New Orleans playing prevent way too far back. They let them march down the field and, Every single play that happened, I just felt more and more sure of the fact that the Falcons were going to walk away with a victory. So if they can just brace themselves for impact, I guess you could say, with whatever the Saints offense is going to bring here, they could be okay. But I will say I'm leaning Saints in this matchup here, and I think they get the job done. They're in New Orleans. They are on absolute fire right now. 
And while I want to believe that Philadelphia can kind of go through all the scrutiny this week and then shock everybody and take down a red-hot New Orleans Saints, there is just way too much momentum flowing through New Orleans right now for me to pick against them. So I'm going to take the Saints, but I'm going to take them in a high-scoring affair. I like them 31-27. to Lots of points in this one here. I think the Saints offense does battle back, but I just, or excuse me, the Eagles offense does battle back this week, but I think that Saints offense is going to be a little bit too much for them to handle. Now we'll take a look at the Los Angeles Chargers heading into Pittsburgh to take on the Steelers. It's been a ground and pound mentality for the Los Angeles Chargers as they are currently ranked number one overall in rushing efficiency, according to NFL Pro's database here. Pittsburgh should be a good test for them, though, as far as running the football is concerned, as they are currently ranked fifth against the run, allowing about 76 yards per game right now. So I'll be curious if the Chargers flirt with the idea of maybe throwing the football a little bit more in this matchup here. Pittsburgh's been excellent at creating pressure. It feels like TJ Watt is constantly having sacks get wiped away from him for whatever obscure penalty reason it may be, but they have been really good at bringing the pressure. But they are 14th in passing yards allowed here, so you can somewhat effectively throw the football. And I'm expecting that what they're doing up front right now does give them a headache as far as running the football. So I wouldn't be shocked to see if Herbert comes in and maybe tests that passing defense just a little bit here. Pittsburgh did score their first and only touchdown last week, and Los Angeles themselves are averaging about 24 points per game right now. You're going to need more than just a singular touchdown if you're Pittsburgh to come out of this game victorious here. And with that in mind, both of these teams right now are the only two teams remaining in the NFL that have allowed less or yeah, less than two touchdowns in this season. Both have only allowed a single touchdown. So this one's going to be a battle. And one other thing that I came across when I was going through some data and some numbers here, again, I cannot plug NFL Pro enough, that, and I'm not sponsored by the NFL or anything. It's just what you can get from them in terms of information is insane. And it's so easy, too, is the other thing. But according to NFL Pro, the way the Los Angeles Chargers defense matches up against the Steelers as far as defending the pass goes might be a little bit of a problem for Justin Fields. He has struggled dealing with zone coverage this season, and the Los Angeles Chargers have dropped back into zone coverage 87% of the time when their opposing quarterbacks are throwing the football. So that is just something to keep an eye on there. He has not had a lot of successes against zone. Most of it is against man. So that is definitely something to keep an eye on here. And Pittsburgh averaging about 3.6 yards per attempt rushing the football themselves. They're going up against a Chargers run defense that has been a above average stopping the run they're ranked about 13th in the league in run stuffs and then sixth in yards per game allowed so I'll be very curious to see how this Steelers offense manages to put enough together to take down the Chargers there are some injuries of course to be concerned about the Chargers have Justin Herbert listed as questionable I think he's going to play the question is more so just how healthy and how good is he feeling in that matchup you also have Josh Palmer Joey Bosa safety Alohi Gilman and also cornerback Jazir Taylor on the Chargers end and then on the Steelers guard Isaac Samalo you have Roman Wilson who's working himself back from an injury on there as well Russell Wilson still listed as questionable sounds like Fields is going to be the guy this week as well Tyler Makovich the linebacker got sent to the IR this week just some things to keep in mind as far as injuries are concerned there but I do think Despite the trip from the West Coast to the East Coast and Pittsburgh being one hell of a place to battle in, I think I'm going to go Chargers on this one here. I have a strong gut feeling that I could be wrong on this one. And every single time I feel like I've said that this season, I've gotten the game wrong. But something tells me the Chargers might be legit. I was doubting them initially. And on top of that, I thought people were buying into the Jim Harbaugh hype a little bit too much. But one thing that has really stood out to me with L.A. has just been how dominant that offensive line is. Joe Alt, as I was saying coming out of the draft, probably one of the most sure things in the league coming out of the draft. And my goodness, has he paid off dividends for the Chargers at this point. So I'll take the Chargers. Low-scoring, Steelers-esque matchup, 20-16. to Going to be a tight one, though. The next matchup we're taking a look at is going to be the Denver Broncos heading into Tampa Bay to take on the Buccaneers. Denver facing another tough opponent in these Bucks with their defense. Not necessarily a bad defense by any means they've been allowing opponents to move but they have been locking up when things get tight heading towards the red zone here as they're only allowing 18 points per game tied for sixth lowest in the league right now Denver's O-line has been struggling I would say to protect their young quarterback in Bo Nix allowing the eighth highest pressure rate in the NFL right now and on top of that facing off against Tampa Bay who has been enjoying a 
thorough blitzing of their opposing offenses that they're going up against, blitzing the eighth most in the NFL right now, creating pressure on basically one in every two blitzes that they send when the quarterback drops back to throw the football. Ball's going to have to come out quickly if Bo Nix wants to find success and if Denver wants to be able to throw the football in this game here. A fun matchup to look at in this one here that I'm really excited to see is going to be Pat Sertan taking on Mike Evans. Sertan's lined up against opponents' primary wide receivers about 80% of the time so far this season, and Mike Evans himself racking up about 103 yards in two touchdowns so far this season. I think that's going to be the biggest matchup we see, and I would not be shocked to see Sertan line up across from Mike Evans for the bulk majority of this game here, being that Mike Evans is that big-bodied touchdown machine, 1,000-yard receiver that he is. I think one thing that's really going to matter in this matchup here, especially if Denver wants to be able to win this game here, is who runs the football more effectively. Both of these teams not necessarily lighting the world on fire with their rushing attacks as Tampa Bay is averaging only 91 yards per game to Denver's 81 and a half, so about 10 yards more per on Tampa Bay's end. Both of these teams have struggled defensively against the run as well, as well, allowing about a five-yard difference between the two, but both of them well into the over 100-yard mark in terms of what they're allowing on a per-game basis here. I think if Denver wants to be able to win this football game, they have to find success running that football against Tampa Bay because I am genuinely concerned, similar to what we saw with Denver against the Pittsburgh Steelers, just how how this Denver offense is going to operate against another defense that is not afraid to really get after you and create pressure and also has been successful at doing that with the way that they blitz. going to be a tough one, in my opinion, for Denver to come out victorious, and that's why I am leading the Buccaneers on this one. I have them winning 27-19. to I think with... Just the situation that is currently brewing offensively in Denver. They are having a tough time a tough time establishing an identity. And that's one of those things that is potentially going to hold this team back from really reaching its fullest potential. So we need to see some really good protection up front from Denver's O-line. But I really like Tampa Bay in this one, especially being at home. It just feels like Bucks shoe in for a W on this one. Next game we'll take a look at here. And I think this is probably worth me just coming out and saying... I am going to have an extremely hard time picking Carolina in just about any single matchup that they go into this year. And I felt like that fairly fairly strongly coming into the season. And after two weeks, I, I feel even more strongly about those feelings that I didn't know that was really possible. But like I look at Carolina right now and just the state of things going on with that organization. It is like... It, you look at the Raiders and it's like the complete opposite. You have a team that is now putting it together and they are playing and putting it all on the line for their head coach over there in Las Vegas. Whereas Carolina, it goes even beyond football and just with what's going on with ownership. And it's unfortunate that the Panthers are in the situation that they are in because it does not feel like they are anywhere close to getting out of the darkness of the tunnel that they're in right now. And it just, it goes beyond football and extends into management and of course ownership as well. There are just some serious organizational failures going on in Carolina right now. You have Andy Dalton coming in now after Bryce Young was benched this past week to try and see if he can save this sinking ship in Carolina. And while Dalton threw for a couple of touchdowns and I believe about 300 yards or so in his last start with Carolina, something along those lines, if I'm not mistaken, I just don't really know what starting Andy Dalton is going to do to really light the fire under this Panthers team, coupled with the fact that the defense has not really been great either. Like, there's nothing on either side of the football right now that leaves me inspired with what Carolina's doing. And the Raiders are coming off of an unbelievable upset victory, big one in Baltimore at that 10-point comeback. There's just a wave of momentum, and this one in Las Vegas – Big travel day for the Carolina Panthers. I don't know how they come out with a victory in this matchup here. Of course, I could always, you know, always the chance that I could be wrong, but I'm leaning Raiders on this one here. This goes beyond football. This is just me looking at one organization to another, and they're in two complete opposite places right now. I'll take the Raiders 26-17, and until I see any sort of results that leave me feeling good about the direction the Panthers are going in, I have no idea how I'm going to even select them for a victory this season. I'll probably get caught once or twice because they'll upset somebody, but I'm pretty sure I picked against the Panthers 16 times last year, and the only two times I got it wrong was when they actually pulled off wins. 
Next game we'll take a look at here. We have ourselves the Miami Dolphins taking on the Seattle Seahawks. This one in Seattle as Miami now tries to figure things out minus Tua who is on the IR. So we're not going to see him for at the very least a month. And then it could potentially even be more than that. I expect to see a fair amount of running coming from Miami in this game here. Seattle allowed a whopping 185 yards last week to New England on the ground. And I think for Miami, the real goal in this game here is to come in Obviously, keep defense honest. You can't just let the defense know you're going to run the football. You're not facing the Colts, who will just allow people to run the football 53 times and not really do anything about it. But you're facing a team that is going to know that you're going to try to run the football, so you need to keep them honest in some capacity here. Keep the quick, the passing game short. Keep it quick. It doesn't have to be anything too crazy because you have Jalen Waddle, You have Tyreek Hill, two guys that you can put the football in their hands, and even Devon Achan, another guy, very explosive as well. You have guys that you can give short completions to, and they have the playmaking ability, the speed that you just can't teach guys to be able to take the football to the house. So keep the passing game short, but obviously play to your strengths, run the football. Don't put Skylar Thompson in a position where he needs to go out and throw for 350 yards to win a football game because I don't think the likelihood of that is high. Now that I've said it, he'll probably throw for 400, but you know we'll cross that bridge if we get there. Seattle secondary, I think with combating what I would expect Miami to do from this offense, just needs to play up tight. They need to be physical at the line of scrimmage here. Like getting off as, as soon as that ball goes off for the snap, you know, bump the wide receivers, throw them off their routes. You got a pretty big group of guys in the secondary over there in Seattle. So be physical up front, be aggressive, and just respect the deep ball. Make sure you have guys to back up your corners if that's what you're doing in press coverage. But don't just let Jalen Waddell or Tyreek Hill if they're not in motion pre-play to just get off the snap clean. Like that that typically doesn't end well for teams that are facing the Miami Dolphins. And again, I know two is not in there, so the passing game maybe isn't going to be as effective, but you still have to respect what Jalen Waddle and Tyreek Hill can do if you're giving them just tons and tons of space. Like it's not the most difficult thing in the world to throw to somebody who's wide open with nobody within five yards of them. So you have to combat what they're able to do off the line of scrimmage here. Bump and you know, bump them, press them, whatever you got to do, throw them off their routes. If if it's if it's Tyree Kill that's in motion, you better be disrupting what Jalen Waddle's doing, and vice versa. Get my idea there. On top of that. Looking at Miami defensively, they've got themselves quite a task here. I think we're about to see a serious dynamic duo emerge, and I was a little bit low on Geno Smith coming into the season here, but there's a good chance that we see the dynamic duo of DK Metcalf and Jackson Smith and Jigba get really crazy this season. Both these guys combined for two, uh, 22 receptions, 146 yards, and a touchdown last, uh, last week. And for what it's worth, New England's been pretty good against the pass so far this year. And they kind of got torched. Granted, one of those plays was a big blown coverage situation here. But, I mean, you see what they're able to do with those wide receivers. You got some studs. Not to mention Tyler Lockett's in that group as well. I'll be very curious to see how Miami handles this group. Because it is a very talented pass-catching group. And if Kenneth Walker is back as well and he's good to go, you could have some serious problems trying to defend this offense that they have over there in Seattle. You have to hope that you're healthy in your running back room. If you're Miami coming to this one here, Raheem Mostert and Jeff Wilson are both listed as questionable right now. I would really hope that at least one of those two guys can go alongside Devon Achan because, again, I think that running game is going to be key. And I also am keeping an eye on some injuries as far as the Seahawks are going. Uchenna Nwosu, Boye Mafe, Leonard Williams, Derek Hall, all guys in that defensive front that you need to keep an eye on because it's a lot of guys up front there that if they're not healthy could pose a risk to that defense that is struggling already against the run. Last thing you want is for two or three of those guys to not make it to this matchup here because Miami could then possibly run crazy on you whether you like it or not. As for who I think is going to win, though, this one being in Seattle makes me feel a lot more comfortable about picking Seattle for the matchup here. Obviously, no Tua is another thing as well, but I do trust in what Mike McDaniel is doing over there offensively that he's going to try to come up with the best scheme possible to put the best players in the best situations to get points on the board. So I wouldn't be shocked if Miami hangs around, but this should be a Seattle victory in my opinion, and I have them winning 25-18. to 18. We now take a look at a game that I think is very difficult to pick because both of these teams are just in very not like just they're not in great spots. You look at the Baltimore Ravens who 
are now sitting on two heartbreaking losses in back-to-back -back weeks. You're a toe away from potentially stealing a win week one. You allow a 10-point comeback to the Raiders in week two at home in front of your crowd. And now the Ravens are facing a Dallas Cowboys team. <clears throat> and this Dallas Cowboys team has not been great offensively. On top of that, they've struggled against the run. And this is a good opportunity for Baltimore to finally get their season on the right track. Dallas allowed 190 yards and four touchdowns on the ground last week. Baltimore being ranked seventh in rushing, tied for second in yards per attempt, and their bread and butter over the last however many years now has been running the football with Lamar Jackson in tow as well there's a chance that Baltimore looks to really expose us in this matchup here and win football or win this football game the way that they like to win football games. Dallas needs to get it going offensively themselves. They currently only have three touchdowns scored so far this season. They're 25th in rushing yards, and yes, they're ninth in passing, but if you dive a little bit deeper into those numbers there, they're sixth in passing attempts altogether. So that number with a quarterback like Dak Prescott, who in my opinion is a pretty good quarterback, you're, that number makes sense if you're passing the football as much as you are. But there's no balance to your offense. You're having a hard time finding the end zone. Thankfully, you're going up against the Ravens defense right now that is allowing 232 yards per game through the air, which is actually a league worst right now. So I would definitely consider you know attacking that secondary, seeing what damage you can do between Dak Prescott and CeeDee Lamb, but they've got to run the football. And then one other thing I'm really keeping an eye on in here is because you have two really fun units to watch is whose pass rush winds up winning this football game. Because I really do think that this is something the game could come down to. Both of these teams have seven sacks racked up so far this season. Dallas creating more consistent pressure than Baltimore is. They're getting pressure on 42.5% of opposing quarterbacks' dropbacks, whereas Baltimore, they're only sitting at about 274 So I will say that I am really interested in which one of these defenses comes out and shuts down the other opponent, opposing offense because neither offense has really been perfect right now. But something tells me, and I, this was another question I had coming into this week, is, you know, do the Ravens come into this game and walk out 0-3? Like, what is the likelihood of that? How many people had on their bingo card 0-3 Ravens start for this season here? you would have thought they'd have at least one win coming out of week three. At least. A lot of people probably would have said two. Do they really go 0-3? Something tells me no. There is a good chance Dallas gets the job done here, especially being in Dallas. I think that bodes well for them. But it's not been perfect for Dallas, Dallas offensively. They have some issues going on, and they really cannot handle the run at all. You got the combo of Derrick Henry and Lamar Jackson that could pose a really big problem for the Cowboys, and I think that is how the Baltimore Ravens wind up getting the job done and ultimately coming out victorious here. I'm going to take the Ravens, but I got them in a tight contest. 27-26, going into Jerry World, getting the job done, getting the victory, getting their season back on track. I'll take the Ravens at 1-2. and two. Now we have the San Francisco 49ers going into Los Angeles to take on the Rams, and... I look at the 49ers and they're definitely hurting, but you look at the Rams and at this point they might as well be playing their games in the ER because this team is decimated with injuries right now. And I have no idea how on earth the Rams managed to pull off even a win or two over the next like four weeks or so with how many guys they have on the IR because it now includes Jonah Jackson, Steve Avila, Joe Noteboom, all starting offensive linemen. You got Puka Nakua, safety John Johnson's on there now as well. Cooper Cup is listed as questionable. But then on the 49ers side, you have obviously Christian McCaffrey, who is missing here, but Jordan Mason's done a very good job in his absence. And then you, of course, have Debo Samuel, who's listed as doubtful. We have seen what this 49ers offense can look like minus some of their stars last year, and it wasn't necessarily pretty by any means. If you go back to that Cleveland Browns, San Francisco 49er game, I believe Debo Samuel, Trent Williams, and Christian McCaffrey all missed that game, if I'm not mistaken. Someone needs to step up for San Francisco, and you could definitely say the same for the Rams, but the Rams need at least like four or five different guys to step up in this game here. And I just think that that's way too much to ask for. 
For me right now, health is the biggest deciding factor in this game, and we kind of saw that unravel with the Cardinals last week when the Rams just got absolutely obliterated. And I consider the 49ers a better team than the Arizona Cardinals at this point in the season, just based off of past history and what I think they should be able to do going forward. So I'm going to take the 49ers in this one here. I have them winning 24-13. to Maybe the Rams play them a little bit closer, but... In my opinion, I just don't really see a way for the Rams to consistently pull off victories. If you're talking offensive line play hasn't been great around the league right now, like passing is way down overall. And that's with teams starting their five guys at the offensive line spots. How are you supposed to do that when your three starters down, your two starting wide receivers are down, and all that's left is essentially Kyron Williams a rookie running back that you have, Tutu Atwell, Demarcus Robinson, uh, Tyler Johnson, and Jordan Whittington as like the guys you're relying on to work with, with Matthew Stafford, of course. Not sure how the Rams get this one done. I'm leaning very heavily on the 49ers in this matchup. We'll next take a look at the Detroit Lions going into the Arizona Cardinals home field. And after two weeks of play, I definitely think Arizona has a legitimate shot at pulling off an upset victory here. This is not one that the Lions are going to come in and expose the Cardinals, in my opinion. Arizona came in last week, absolutely took advantage of the state that the Rams are currently in, as we were just talking about, and they racked up some sacks against that O-line. They're now sitting on seven on the season. Despite allowing the fifth most pressure so far, though, Detroit has been really good at keeping Jared Goff upright. They've only allowed two sacks to this point, and Jared Goff just does a really good job under pressure. He's done a very good job of taking care of the football, avoiding some of that pressure, and extending plays himself. Jared Goff, really good quarterback, super underrated quarterback, and it's funny how many people still don't think he's good at what he's doing here. On top of that, when you look at Detroit's end, I think defensively they really have to figure out a way to contain Kyler Murray because he has been a big problem for defenses so far this season. And on top of that, you now have to figure out Marvin Harrison Jr. Marvin Harrison Jr. finally got his arrival last week. Four receptions, I think it was 130 yards, two touchdowns. That is more along the lines of what we were expecting to see from Marvin Harrison Jr. every single week. Obviously, that's not a realistic number to have, but four, uh, one reception in four yards in week number one was not anywhere near what anyone had in terms of expectations for this guy. He's got the pedigree. He's got the physical talents. He's got the skills. He's got the route running. He's got the hands. He is going to be a difference maker for this offense, and the Detroit Lions need to be able to take care of him in coverage. And I am a little bit concerned about that because you have four defensive backs currently listed on your injury report as questionable in your safeties, Kirby Joseph, Ifatu Melifuanu, Terry and Arnold, the rookie. You got Ennis Rakestraw in there as well. So there is some concern with how they're going to deal with Marvin Harrison Jr. and company in that wide receiver room. But also on top of that, Kyler Murray, who is going to be the guy that plays spy to Murray that does not allow him to rip off these runs. He has five runs for a first down so far this season, averaging 11.6 yards per attempt that he takes off with the football. Somebody has to bottle him up if they want to come out victorious here. You're also looking at, in this one here, Detroit's rushing attack versus the run defense in Arizona right now. Detroit averaging 151 yards per game and 5.2 yards per attempt, ranked number four. Even when opposing defenses are stacking the box, they have been able to run the football effectively no matter what opponents have done against them. Arizona, meanwhile, allowing only 91 yards per game, but they have the eighth lowest rushing attempts attempted against them. So that is something to keep in mind there. That number might be skewed a little bit just because of how low the attempts numbers are. So I'm curious if Detroit is able to ground and pound the way they like to do and beat this Arizona Cardinals team in a submission. Now, as for who I think is going to come out victorious here, I do think that there is a good chance that we see a a little bit of an expose on the Arizona Cardinals defense in this matchup here. This is a group that I think might be overachieving just a little bit too much. I could be wrong, obviously, but I think that the Lions offense might really be able to give them some problems. But I do think this Arizona Cardinals offense, especially if there's enough of these guys that are listed as questionable on Detroit's end who wind up missing the game here, are able to find some success offensively. It's clear James Conner is not done doing what he's doing, and he has been as good as anyone in Arizona for the last handful of years since leaving 
leaving Pittsburgh. On top of that, again, you have a solid wide receiver room with Marvis and Harrison Jr. You, of course, have Greg Dortch that's over there. For those of you who don't know who he is, great guy, great receiver for them. You also have Michael Wilson as well. You have an offense that works, that can be effective. You have a quarterback who can rip runs for first downs at like 10, 11 yards plus a clip if need be to help keep drives alive. This one winds up being a high-scoring affair in my opinion, but I have the Lions getting it done 30-28 to for the victory. We next look at Sunday Night Football, and this is a matchup I'm really looking forward to here because there is a lot to look at between these two teams. We have the defending back-to-back Super Bowl champions going into Atlanta to take on the Falcons. KC comes into this game averaging 26.5 points per game after another tight matchup against Cincinnati last week. Atlanta's defense has played it tough the last couple of weeks. They're allowing just under 20 points per game at this current moment here. I do think Kansas City has their work cut out for them. However, If Atlanta wants to actively slow down this Chiefs offense and win this football game, they've got to find a way to generate some pressure up front. Atlanta has not really been great despite the investments made into that pass rush, like going and getting Matthew Judon from the Patriots. They have not been great when it comes to creating pressure. They are the worst in the league with creating pressure and only being able to do so one out of every five dropbacks that the opposing quarterback takes one in five that is not conducive of a disruptive defense on top of that Kansas City's offensive line is one of the best at keeping the pocket clean for Mahomes they've got to find a way whether it's blitzing a little bit more or just being a little bit more creative with the stunts you have your defensive line doing to generate some pressure and force Patrick Mahomes into situations that he's not comfortable with and we know that there's really not a lot so you have to do something up front Not going to say that KC won't have any challenges, though. You look at what happened to running back Isaiah Pacheco. He's on the IR. They've had to go dip into the well of free agents, and they bring back Kareem Hunt, who has matured, according to Andy Reid here. I'm really excited to see what Kareem Hunt does here because it feels like he's kind of like a hired gun at this point where he doesn't start on a team initially at the beginning of the season. He just waits for a good opportunity and then jumps on it, and he did so this year with the Chiefs. He did it last year with the Browns. Luckily for the Chiefs, though, ATL hasn't been great against the run, so even though they're going to be missing their star running back in Isaiah Pacheco, they're allowing 161 yards on the ground in Atlanta, so that is definitely something that they could take advantage of. It's just a matter of does Kareem Hunt get up to speed into those other running backs like Samaj P. Ryan, and I think it's Carson Steele is the other guy's name, how effective they can be on the ground. But there is a possibility that you know the Chiefs' offense maybe looks a little bit more one-dimensional than it has so far this season. For Atlanta's offense, it really is just, in my opinion, simply getting your best guys involved. I look at Atlanta on paper, and you just have such a talented group of guys to work with as far as skill positions go. You have Drake London at wide receiver. You now have Darnell Mooney, who is flashing as well, but coupled with a running back like Bijan Robinson. You have Kyle Pitts at tight end. You have so much athleticism and talent to work with. It's just a matter of getting that football in their hands for them to make plays. KC, though, has a really good defense. They've got some stars to be able to counter all these stars that they have on offense in Atlanta with guys like Trent McDuffie. The linebacking room is one of the best in the NFL with Nick Bolton, Drew Tranquil, Leo Chanal. You also have Eric Reed, the safety there, vet that's been able to do some really good things in the backside of that defense there. I'm very, very excited to see how this game plays out. Third down is also going to be a battle that I think is worth watching here. Both of these defenses have not been great on third down and getting opponents off the football field, both allowing a conversion rate over 40% against opposing offenses. So especially for Atlanta's sake, if they can just keep the ball going, keep turning those downs over again and again, or not, not turning them down, I guess, moving the chains rather is what you'd want to say, and just keep chugging that ball down the football field you have a shot you have the talent to compete and I think we saw it granted this was against like crazy crazy off prevent defense from the Philadelphia Eagles last week but you saw what this offense could potentially be when they're clicking Kirk Cousins is making the right reads his guys are getting open what this offense could be in that final drive of the game so with that this is definitely going to be a close contest I don't think it's a runaway by the Chiefs however I am leaning the Super Bowl champions. Just how I said with the Carolina Panthers earlier, 
It's the total opposite, but the same idea. I just have a very hard time picking against Kansas City in matchups. They have not done me wrong so far this season, 2-0 with my picks on them, winning both their first couple of games. I think this game here, though, does determine what Atlanta is going forward. A loss to the Chiefs isn't necessarily the worst thing in the world, especially if it winds up being a close one. But if Atlanta can't hang and the Super Bowl champions wind up kind of exposing Atlanta for what they are, which is a team that is good on paper, but maybe not necessarily on the football field, you might have yourself a problem for the Falcons. But I do like the Chiefs. I think it's going to be tight. I have them winning 26-20. to 20. Being in Atlanta, it's going to be a tough one, but I do like Kansas City. And then moving into Monday night, we've got two matchups for Monday night football this week. Doubleheader. I've already said this in the past, but I'll say it again. Not the biggest fan of this. I would love to be able to just watch one game, then the other, or them just not do something like this. But it is what it is. Jacksonville going into Buffalo to take on the Bills. Jacksonville's O-line has been in rough shape. They're allowing a ton of pressure. About 37.7% of the time, someone is getting in and making Trevor Lawrence's life miserable. On top of that, Buffalo, they haven't been necessarily the best in the world at creating pressure, but they are sitting on six sacks. So when they do get that pressure going, they have been coming away with sacks on the opposing quarterback. The one thing that we need to take a look at here is that Jacksonville – Despite the issues that they've had on offense this year and their inability to really protect Trevor Lawrence, they have found more success consistently running the football than they have passing the football. They're currently averaging 5.4 yards per attempt on the ground, which is tied for sixth best, best right now. And Buffalo is allowing about 4.5 yards per attempt and 131 yards per game on the ground. And on top of that, they've allowed opposing running backs to score a touchdown in each of the last two games here. I think for Jacksonville's sake, especially with how explosive Buffalo's offense has looked over these last couple of weeks here trying to control the football and limit possessions for the Buffalo Bills is probably something that they really need to consider here and maybe just shy a little bit away from the passing game and lean into your running backs in Tank Bigsby in Travis Etienne who I know had a really unfortunate fumble in week number one right at the goal line but control the football and try to keep the score low is probably in the best interest of Jacksonville. You also have to try to deal with a guy in James Cook who is clearly emerging and has now let everyone know that he is an X factor on this Buffalo offense. He has 198 yards and three touchdowns total through two weeks of play. And despite being 0-2, I will say Jacksonville does have a shot. <clears throat> they've been pretty good at slowing down opposing offenses despite the struggles that they've had so far. But Buffalo is coming in. And with James Cook doing what he's doing, Josh Allen showing in week one that he can still do what he does, and that's throw the Superman cape on if he needs to. They're averaging a whopping 32.5 points per game. Jacksonville has got to keep this one tight. So that, again, that goes back to my whole idea. you got to control the football. You have to prevent Buffalo from finding the end zone. They've been doing a great job so far this season of doing it. You've got to take away possessions from them. On top of that, Jacksonville just needs to find a way to score, simply put. Like, yes, try to keep the score low, but they're averaging 15 points per game right now, and that's not going to be good enough to beat the Buffalo Bills. It absolutely was not week one, absolutely was not week two. You are not going to beat Buffalo if you're coming away with 17 points, 20 points. You've got to probably get, like, 23-plus and hope that you can hold to Buffalo to, like, under 20 yourself. And that's probably the best route you can go. Easier said than done, but that's kind of what you're looking at here. As for who I think comes out and wins, though, I did have the question that I posed coming into this season here about what Jacksonville was and if they were the team that went 8-1 and one last season or the team that ultimately crashed and burned and missed the playoffs during the back half of the season. And unfortunately, through two weeks, we're seeing more of the this is the team that was struggling in the back half of last season and not that 8-1 and one team. I'm hoping they can turn it around, but Buffalo is just on an absolute roll right now. And it almost feels like they're on like a, a, a you know, shut up all the doubters tour at this very moment. I'm taking Buffalo and I have them winning 35 to 21. Something tells me that might even be a little bit too much in terms of points given to the Jaguars, but Buffalo has been punching everyone in the mouth, even if it has been a slow start in like week number one when you saw their matchup against Arizona. And something tells me they're going to keep doing that because they have a point to get across to everyone in the league that this offense is not just going to fall apart because they lost Stephon Diggs and Gabe Davis like a lot of people, even myself included, kind of were anticipating. 
And then finally, last but certainly not least, we have ourselves the Washington Commanders taking on the Cincinnati Bengals in Cincinnati. The Bengals still winless after two weeks. However, they played the Chiefs extremely tight and borderline should have won that game. But DPI cost them positioning, cost them the opportunity to stop the Chiefs on that final drive, and it ultimately leads to a Harrison Butker field goal for the win. I will say that what we saw from Cincinnati's offense last week was far more promising than what we got in week number one against the Patriots. And now coming into this matchup with Washington allowing 27 and a half points per game, the fourth highest yards per play in the NFL at 6.2 on defense, and then the worst third down defense in the league, there is a good chance that we see this Cincinnati offense really arrive. Unfortunately, a couple weeks too late, but if the whole slow start Bengals thing is very real this is where the Bengals are supposed to get hot and then start rolling from here on out with Joe Burrow of course under center I do have a question for Cincinnati though and that's how they plan on containing rookie quarterback Jaden Daniels out of all of the three rookie quarterbacks that are starting so far this year Jaden Daniels and I don't even think it's really close has looked like the best quarterback out of all three of them he's getting the ball out in just a quick 2.31 seconds like fastest among quarterbacks in the NFL right now like he's getting the ball out quick which is good and this is what I've been saying about Bo Nix and Caleb Williams too. get the football out of these young guys hands quickly do not force them to have to hold on to the ball make all these complicated reads allow these defenses to be flashing all over their faces just quick options quick decisions quick plays get the ball out quick and we've been seeing it work really well with Jaden Daniels you couple that with the fact that he's working with a 75.5 percent completion rate he's got 410 passing yards he's got 132 yards on the ground and a couple of rushing touchdowns to go for it I'll be very interested in who winds up being the guy that has to spy Jaden Daniels if they split it between anyone or if there's someone in specific that they want to cover that but I'm very curious to see how Cincinnati's defense goes about doing that and as far as Washington offensively, all they really need to do is just get to the end zone. They had a ton of drives go really far last week, but ultimately you settle for seven field goals. That is not conducive of winning football, unfortunately. Granted, you were playing the Giants last week, and that is a team you can beat kicking seven field goals. But most teams in the league are not going to lose to you if you're kicking seven field goals. It doesn't happen very often. So we just got to turn some of those field goal drives into touchdown drives. And on top of that, I think the best way for them to do that is to run the football. They're averaging 176 yards per game on the ground right now, which is good for sixth best in the NFL. As I mentioned, Jaden Daniels has been really good with his decision-making and running the football as well. Brian Robinson has looked really good as well running the football. Washington should definitely try their best to control the clock a bit, control the football altogether. Again, limit possessions because this is supposed to be a better offense than yours. So you want to prevent them from getting the football as much as possible. Cincinnati's allowing nearly 160 yards per game on the ground. If you can attack them on the ground effectively, you do have a shot to kick a down-and-out Bengals team right now even further into the ground. The opportunity is there. However, though, I am leaning Cincinnati in this game here. I just think that the Bengals, this is where they figure it out. This is at least supposed to be, history tells us, where they figure it out. It's been ugly, and I don't think that this even gets that much prettier. I think it's a win, but I have them winning 27-22. to 22. So it's a win, but I think it's an ugly win. I'm not going to sit here and say that the Bengals run away with this matchup here. The defense is pretty suspect in Washington, and there's a good chance they take advantage of that. But Cincinnati's defense hasn't been perfect by any means, and I think that there's an opportunity with how comfortable Jaden Daniels probably is now two games in, no real big mistakes, scored a couple of touchdowns already, has yet to throw a passing touchdown, but has been effective throwing the ball. He's probably feeling pretty comfortable himself, and that team as a whole is feeling comfortable with him, and that's a really good place to be in with a young, mobile, threatening type of quarterback to have in his first season. So I don't think it's pretty. Bengals get the job done, 27-22, but I do think the Commanders might make them sweat a little bit. But those are my picks. Those are my thoughts for this weekend slate of games. Fire away in the comment section down below. Let me know who do you have, who wins, who loses, what am I getting right, what am I getting wrong. But that is it for me. If you made it to the end, as always, I greatly appreciate it. I'll catch you all next time. Have a good one.